will always be much more to me. Just recently, the Idaho Senate on Monday approved legislation to expressly permit using the Bible for academic study in public schools, even though state law already permits using the Bible for academic purposes. Um, one of the Republican senators there says Senate Bill 1342 would clarify any misconceptions in current code by overtly allowing the religious text in the classroom. My name is Kevin Conover. I'm your host on Educate for Life. We're on K Praise 1210 AM here in San Diego every Saturday, 2 to 3 PM. And we're discussing all kinds of issues that have to do with the Bible, politics, culture, and uh, our, our faith in Jesus Christ. And I have a really special guest today. Uh, his name is Dr. Henry Morris. Very likely you've heard of him, Dr. Henry Morris III. He's a former college professor, administrator, business executive, and senior pastor. He has four earned degrees, including a D-min from Luther Rice Seminary and the President's and Key Executive's MBA from Pepperdine University. He's the eldest son of ICR's founder, Henry Morris Jr., PhD, and he's written tons of books and articles, and uh, he's very passionate about communicating the truth of the Bible and the importance of Christian maturity and leadership. Dr. Morris, thanks so much for being on the air today. Uh, you're welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me. All the way from Dallas, Texas. Indeed. Yep. And uh, he's actually in town. Uh, Dr. Morris, you're in town for uh, the birthday of uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye. Dr. Tim LaHaye is celebrating his 90th birthday this weekend. Incredible. And uh, what, what, why would you, for our listeners who don't know the background, I figured we'd, we'd uh, just get a little... Uh, you know, firsthand knowledge from you. Why did you fly all the way from Texas to celebrate the 90th birthday of Tim LaHaye? My father and Dr. Tim LaHaye were close friends. In fact, uh, together they founded what is now San Diego Christian College uh, back in the 70s. Dr. LaHaye and my father met uh, in the speaking circuit back in the 60s after his book, The Genesis Flood, had been uh, released. And that was 1961, 1961 when that book came out, right? yep. and uh, Dr. LaHaye met him soon after that, and they thought about working together and forming Christian Heritage College then. Yeah, as well as um, we just celebrated the 50th an anniversary of Christian High School also. Indeed. Yeah, so that, uh, Tim LaHaye was involved in that, and that, and, and your father heavily influenced um, the philosophy of the school as well. Yes, Dr. LaHaye and my father were, were close associates for a number of years, Jan and I, and my wife, uh, were members out at uh, then Scott Memorial Baptist yeah, Church yeah. Uh, way back in the 70s and 80s and have fond memories. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, here we are, we have Idaho, uh, you know, writing a bill saying the Bible can now be used in schools. And, you know, this is an interesting thing that's happening in, in the Idaho bill. They're actually saying you can reference the Bible for history, mm -hmm. uh, sociology, you know, these sorts of stuff, literature, but you can't actually use it in the science classroom. Now, I would guess that you'd probably, uh, you know, be opposed to that that viewpoint that the Bible is not scientific. Well, if, if the Bible is God's word, then God would have to tell us the truth about things that we can test and look at. If if God lied to us in Genesis, we got a real problem with the rest of Scripture. Absolutely. So science should be a confirming effect. It doesn't prove the Bible. God doesn't need our proof one way or another, but science is a tremendous friend for the Bible-believing Christian. Mm -hmm. So uh, when your father started, uh, he wrote the book, The Genesis Flood. It's interesting to me because he's a, he was an engineer, is that correct? That's correct. Now, do you, where was he working at the time when he uh, decided to write that what book? What was then Virginia Polytechnic Institute in Blacksburg, Virginia. He was head of the civil engineering department there. Okay, and so what happened? I mean, here, here he is. He's got a, a probably a good career in engineering. He's making plenty of money, and he decides he wants to jump in and write a book on the Genesis Flood. What, what, ha what was going through his mind at the time? Well, way back when he was going to school at Rice University down in Houston, Texas. It was one of the hotbeds of essentially atheism back in those days. Mm. And Dad was struggling with his own faith and saw the tremendous conflict right on the surface between what the opening verses of Scripture talked about and what he was learning in the classroom. And that uh, formed a, a real knot in his soul, and he began to search, and God called him into this unique ministry. Now, uh, I mean, I was reading uh, earlier the Washington Post um, when they were they wrote an article up on your father uh, when he he passed away at eighty seven. Uh, what what year did he pass away? Uh, Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Went home to be with Jesus, and um, they wrote a, a, a very positive uh, write up about they did. him. Yes, they did. Yeah, very nice. And um, they talked about he wrote more than sixty books. Uh, incredible. I, I mean, he had a fire lit under him. 
and you you as well you he, he passed on those genes right well Is that- <laughs> I, I would beg to differ and i've written 13 books so i've got a long way to catch oh, yeah. up <laughs> so um it says here even longtime opponent the late stephen jay gould acknowledged that that book the book the genesis flood was the founding document of the creationist movement it was the first time that someone of my father's professional ilk tackled the issues from a scientific perspective. Mm-hmm. There'd been a lot of theological bantering back and forth, but no one had really dealt with the science side of the issue. And Dad had both a geological background as well as a hydraulics background from his civil engineering training, and specifically took an emphasis in his PhD program at the University of Minnesota to focus on the water issue. Yeah. Because at that time, the geological structure and the sedimentary rock of the earth were the main proof for the millions and millions of years. Mm. Yeah. And it says here in this article, in 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that creationism was a form of religion, not science, and could not be taught in the nation's schools. Uh, Dr. Morris and his team at the Institute for Creation Research, ICR, which you are the CEO of today, um, were uh, taking a stand against that. And uh, I find that interesting that they would say that that creationism is is religion, but that evolution is science. Well, always the the guys in the with the big club want to keep out the the outsiders if they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, The evidence for evolution is really most at best circumstantial and far more than that more of a, just a very sophisticated storytelling very See, speculative what what very would spe- be an example that for our listeners as far as when you make the claim that uh hey this is this is uh circumstantial what kind of evidence is circumstantial well for instance the order of the fossils that you see in the textbooks all the time mm-hmm. it exists in the textbooks it really doesn't exist in the fossil record and you're missing those famous transitional forms as we dig through the fossil record and try to line up the various uh, scalability of the fossils from the simple to complex. That's the kind of the organizational story of evolution. Yeah. You you see dogs and cats, but you don't see any cogs or dats. You don't see anything in between. There is nothing there that demonstrates the movement from one kind of animal into another. I see what you're saying. Okay. And that's just really, if somebody wants to believe in evolution, they can kind of put the fossils together, line them you up. You can and make say, a story and yeah. tell a story without God in it. That's essentially what they're doing. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. Okay. So he jumps in, he writes uh, the book, The Genesis Flood. Um, how was that received by the general populace? Was that... Uh, uh, well, there was a real resistance, of course, in the scientific community because yeah. it was sort of in your face. But the Christian community reacted tremendously, and there was almost like a a revival, a harvest among men of education whose hearts were hungering for confirmation of their faith, but had really been taught nothing but evolution on the other side. And Dad's book in the uh, backup with Dr. John Whitcomb, who did the biblical and theological side of the book, uh, provided a tremendous platform from which to begin studying these issues very, very carefully. And that's going, uh, and now your ministry, what you're doing is delving even deeper into these yes. issues and and really digging down and finding good, solid uh, evidence that the biblical account of We're a flood. Now coming up uh, on 47 years uh, of ICR's existence and uh, full professional staff dealing with genetics as well as geology and all of the issues in biology and physiology and physics and nuclear physics and astronomy and we've just got them all the bases pretty well covered now you were telling me before the show that your ministry what you primarily uh focus on is research is that correct correct and so what you have are research scientists on your staff who are uh, looking at what we see around the world from a uh from a scientific creationist perspective so we it's try a- to deal with the evidence that yeah. which a uh, scientist basically is someone who observes and then documents the observation and then tests his observation tries to reproduce the test and come up with an an explanation for what he sees now we take the data that is scientific empirical testable reproducible even falsifiable and look at it from a biblical perspective and as we would anticipate it verifies the biblical model rather than otherwise yeah and so uh, yeah and i like to point this out to people all we're, what we're doing here is we're looking at a creationist hypothesis versus an evolutionary hypothesis and, and saying which theory accounts for the data most completely 
If you're going to be objective, that's really what you should try to do. Here are two models, two theories, mm -hmm. two hypotheses, call them what you want to call sure. them. And then you evaluate the data. Which of the models fit the data with the least amount of contradictions, least amount of conflicts? The one that's the least complicated, the one that's the most fittable, is usually the best one. That's fantastic. My guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. Stay with us. We're going to continue to talk about ICR and evidence for a recent creation and the scientific truth of the Bible. You're on Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teaching. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. In 1947, Gordon Tucker began serving San Diego County families. Today, the family tradition continues with two stores, Tucker's Valley Furniture and Cash and Carry, both right across the street in El Cajon at Maine and Mollison. Whether you want today's modern, eco-friendly furniture or authentic Amish furniture from solid cherry wood built in America, let the Tucker family serve your family. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. A proud sponsor of Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. Thanks for tuning in. You're on Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. And we're on Cape Ray's 12, 10 a.m. here in San Diego every Saturday, 2 to 3 p.m. And uh, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. We're talking about ICR, the Institute for Creation Research, as well as evidence for a recent creation, the scientific credibility of the Bible. And uh, what we were talking about before the break, we were talking about the fact that in 1961, his father wrote the very first scientific creationism book. And that kind of got the, the ball rolling as far as, hey, let's look at what the Bible uh, says historically from a scientific perspective. Do we have scientific proof to validate those claims? And I want to encourage you to go to his website. It's henrymorris3.com. Is that right, Dr. Morris? Well, that's the, the, the blog site, but that's, icr.org is the official site. Yeah, that's easy too. ICR. I use that site all the time for tons of research. It's got so many uh, fantastic yeah, articles. Lots and lots of archive material on there. You can wear out dozens of printers. It's all free. That's right. That's fantastic. And so um, also you have on your website, you have five reasons to believe in a recent creation, a free ebook. Correct. And so I was going to ask you about that. Um, why is this such an important issue for, for you and for the ministry? Why is there such a big focus on this? Um, there's so many other issues that that uh, that are relevant. Why this issue? That that uh, well, because the Bible begins this way. Of all the religious books in the world, and there are hundreds of them, this is the only one that says, "In the beginning, God created." Everything else starts with the assumption of eternal matter or some sort of ca chaos over millennia. Mm -hmm. The issue really boils down to whether or not that is demonstrably true or not. If that's not true, then the rest of the Scripture is pretty suspicious. In fact, the whole gospel message is based on the historicity of those first three chapters of Genesis. If they're not accurate, then the gospel message is kind of silly. Yeah, that, that's absolutely the truth. Uh, you know, I was reading a Gallup poll. It said that 42% of um, Americans, actually, 42%, this was a study done here in the U.S., uh, believe that it, 4 in 10 Americans continue to believe that God created humans in their present form uh, less than 10,000 right. years ago. Yeah, it, it's still a, what, what uh, used to be called a Christian memory. Mm -hmm. We've been trained that way back in our early uh, part of this 20th century. But we're beginning to lose it, not only in the academic world, which has gone essentially secular for the last 150 years, but even within the churches, we've lost the context of the authority of Scripture. But the Bible really is accurate. You can trust it, not only in things for salvation and heaven and hell and sins forgiven and those sorts of wonderful things, but really for history and for archaeology and for science. 
There's a lot of data in the Scripture that is testable, and if we can test it and it proves to be accurate, then we have no logical reason to reject the rest of it. Yeah, I find it interesting, too, that this seems to be kind of a biblical mandate in the sense that uh, the Bible says very clearly, um, test all things. Yes. And so it's telling us you have to be able to confirm that what you believe is the truth, because otherwise you're going to easily be let off on a track down well, a path. The definition that's... for faith there in Hebrews 11 is the evidence and substance. The things that we cannot see and cannot touch have to be in some way or other confirmable to us, because we cannot test eternity. We cannot test heaven and hell. That's outside of our realm of experience. But we can test what God has revealed to us, and if it's accurate, then we should be able to at least logically trust the rest of Scripture. Oh, I love that. And uh, again, in the life of Christ, do you have any examples from the life of Christ where Christ expects people sure. to— Sure. No, as a matter of fact, the whole Gospel of John is built around seven great creation miracles where God creates something out of nothing— the very first one where he turned water into wine, you remember that? Uh-huh, uh-huh. H2O, the simplest of all molecular compounds, by his thought, he turns it into fibers and sugars and acids and bases, creation of new matter instantaneously without a command, without any laboratory equipment, just with his thought. And he said several times, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, believe what I'm doing. I'm demonstrating that I am your creator as well as your redeemer. Yeah, I love it. I love it how he says, look, if you don't believe I have the power to forgive sins, right? But if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe because of what I do, because that is the evidence of the Only truth. Only God can do this. Of the truth of who I am. And so we can look at creation, like you're saying. We can look at geology. We can look at uh, the fossils. We can look at uh, carbon dating, these sorts of things, and we can gather those same evidences that give us they the faith. They can verify the yeah. authority of Scripture. Absolutely. God doesn't need our proof. God's true whether anybody believes it or not, but it is confirming and encouraging for us to know that these things are really demonstrably accurate. So you would say to those who are listening who they're, they're, they're thinking to themselves, well, first of all, I don't know what evidence there is uh, to believe in a recent creation from a evidential perspective or a, uh, you know, what scientific evidence validates that. You have this this free ebook on your website, henrymorristhe3rd.com, your blog, mm -hmm. um, and there's tons of information on icr.org. What are some of the, for you, the most compelling evidences from what we see around us, God's creation? Well, the easiest thing to see is design and order and purpose. I mean, everything everything we look at has has structure to it, and well, the old phrase the. <laughs> The simplest things are not simplex anymore. I mean, when we talk about a cell, we're talking about something that's enormously complex. Yeah. And the more we're learning, we're seeing they can't just just happen. They they have engineering structure in them and fail-safe systems and timing systems and multiple languages. I mean, we're beginning to learn now about the DNA that just boggles our brain on the amount of information that's stored in the chemicals of our bodies. And you, you, uh, ICR has produced a whole series on this for, yes, for f families and individuals who want to, uh, we have a series of videos out called unlocking the mysteries of Genesis, as well as a new series out on the human body called made in his image. And it's really kind of exciting. They're all short, about 20 minutes. Yeah. So you can look at them and kind of enjoy them. They're the cool stuff as the kids like to say. Absolutely. And they're ideal for, uh, you know, whatever, maybe home fellowships Classrooms, or uh, homeschools. Yeah. Sunday school, there's designed for a classroom setting or even just a home devotional setting. That's great. And you're you're um you have a conference actually coming up um October seventh through Sunday, right, October on an ocean 9th. Side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's right here in our town, Calvary Chapel Oceanside, October seventh through October ninth. If you're interested, um, they're going to have all kinds of speakers, including uh, Dr. Morris himself, as well as Dr. Jason Lyle, Dr. Jake Herp, uh, Hebert, Hebert, mm -hmm. and uh, going to be speaking on issues um, like the Ice Age, the Flood, astronomy, all these sorts of things. And uh, this will be a great opportunity for people to... We, we get down in some of the weeds where it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. We can get down into the details. That's fantastic. Okay, well, um, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris, and we're talking about... You know, the scientific creationism movement, we're talking about evidence for a recent creation and why this is so important, and ultimately uh, also the authority of Scripture. Um, 
what is the final authority in our lives? Is it people's opinions? Is it current culture? Is it uh, maybe a tradition or a habit of the church? Or is it even, you know, some people don't realize it, but they're putting science ahead of the Bible or what I like to call and many people call scientism, which is something that's actually not science at all. And so we have to be really careful about putting something else in front of the Bible. Um, and this is a passion of yours, Dr. Morris. Right. Uh, where do we see this happening as far as where do you see this happening as you're on the cutting edge here of looking at this I kind of stuff? I think in most of our churches, we've fallen short on the discipleship end of things. We're pretty good in the evangelical world of bringing people to know the Lord as their Savior and Redeemer. And of course, that's the beginning point, but really that's just the beginning point. We're supposed to mature them and bring them along so that they not only grow in their intellectual ability to respond to the issues of their lives, but grow in a confidence and an assurance in their relationship with God where they really enjoy their Christian faith. Mm. And do you offer any resources that would help a church pastor or um, somebody else that would... Uh, yeah, we've got, as a scientific term, we've got gobs and gobs of yeah. resources for the pastor. As far as discipleship is concerned? Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Just uh, go on our website, icr.org, and type in the word discipleship or evidence or dinosaurs or whatever. We've got a Google search engine on it. Okay. Or terrific. Yeah, I was, I was speaking to a um, pastor a while back, uh, older gentleman, and he was telling me, he said... You know, Kevin, I feel that my generation failed in a particular area, and that was we failed in the area of discipleship. Right. Um, we have not passed on. And we, so, have, we haven't matured our saints. Yeah, absolutely. My, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. We're going to be right back here. But right now what we're talking about again is uh, the ministry ICR.org. It's Institute for Creation Research. They're based out of Dallas, Texas, and they, they will provide you with all the information you need to... Uh, look at the science and go, wow, uh, this confirms the truth of God's word. Stay with us. We're going to continue this discussion and uh, we'll be right back. I'm Kevin Conover. You're on Educate for Life. For your peace inside my soul. This was not what I would have Not all home inspections are created equal. Experience matters. Joe DeMars and his team at Housemaster have performed inspections in San Diego for 22 years plus and performed over 10,000 inspections for commercial, multiple family, apartments, and residential. So call before you buy or sell and protect your investment. Call 619-660-7866 or online at sandiego.housemaster.com. Home inspections done right. Guaranteed. 619-660-7866. How can you live in San Diego and miss out on enjoying the water? Fast Lane Kayaking sells popular Hobie Cat kayaks that you pedal, not paddle. That means your hands are left free for fishing and fun. Just throw these on your roof rack. They're light and they're easy to use and maintain. Just rinse them off. Try one free on a demo ride. For 36 years, Ron and Debbie Lane have served San Diego with fun, family-friendly water sports of all kinds. Learn more. FastLaneSailing.com. 619-222-0766. Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I want to know you. I want to find you in every season. Thanks for tuning in today. We're on Educate for Life Radio with... Kevin Conover, that's me, your host, and we're on K-Praise in San Diego every Saturday, 2 to 3 p.m. We're discussing all kinds of issues that relate to our culture from a biblical perspective, and right now what we're talking about is creationism, and uh, this is a, it's really a hot issue in our churches today. It's amazing to me that the church is—some churches are embracing evolution, and the claim that I hear out there is, hey, it doesn't—all that matters is that we know Christ— it doesn't matter whether you believe in evolution, whether you believe in old, an old earth or a young earth or a recent creation or a progressive day creation. It doesn't matter. All that matters is Jesus Christ. And my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. He is the son, the eldest son of Dr. Henry Morris, uh, who many consider the founder of the creationist creation science movement in America. And uh, Dr. Morris, how would you respond to somebody who said, hey, all that really matters is Jesus. Um, you know, this is not even worth taking the time to discuss. 
Well, Jesus claims to be the creator. As a matter of fact, if he's not, if he's just, well, let's call him a powerful person or a wonderful teacher or even a, a, a miracle worker, well, that's hardly sufficient to take care of the sins of every human being that's ever lived since Adam and ever will live throughout eternity. He's got to be an infinite God with infinite power and infinite knowledge to be able to take care of that. Yeah. So his work on Calvary had to be the substitution of God himself for our sins rather than just a nice guy who loved us. I was reading an uh, article written by an atheist re recently, and uh, because I like to stay up on uh, what they're thinking and everything, and he said, essentially, Darwinism, uh, what it did was it retired Jesus, mm, is what yeah. he said. The old God is dead idea. Yeah, yeah. We don't need God anymore. God has been sort of a figment of our imagination to help us out, but science has proven we don't need God anymore. But isn't it true that if 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 sin wasn't brought into the world through death in Genesis, then in a sense, if that was true, then Jesus would well, not be necessary. Is death, that... death becomes a good thing then. Yeah. See, if, if, if God created death, if God, death was a natural part of the order, then death is the good thing. Death is the mean by which the better comes into existence. But the Bible says death is our enemy. In fact, we're told that that's the last enemy that God will defeat, and Christ had to die to defeat death. If that's not accurate, then his death on the cross was just kind of a foolish martyrdom death for a lost cause. Mm -hmm. There just is no compromise here. It's either or. Yeah, it's really hard to get around. Yeah, so I I um, have been at many times out to the museum out in Santee, and ICR is the one who started the museum. That's still, it's it's now called the Creation and Earth mm -hmm. History Museum. Tom Cantor's the yeah, one Tom, responsible for that. Yeah, it's fantastic. And um I have some good, a good friend of mine works out there and uh, I love all that they're doing. And that was started by ICR though. Is that right? Way back when, yes. In the, in the seventies, as a matter of fact. So what was the vision there when that was started? Uh, well, Lord willing, just to provide some information, essentially it was an information source that yeah. kind of developed over time with some demonstrations and so on. But because of the size of the land and the, the capability of what we were designed to do as far as a ministry, that wasn't our main thing. It was sort of an adjunct that we did. We're now getting ready to do a much larger, more sophisticated job in Dallas with, uh, we're calling it a discovery center rather than a museum. Yeah, more interactive. Much more interactive. Typically, museums are kind of walk and gawk. You know, you, you look at things and you see things that's interesting or an entertainment venue where it becomes sort of spectacular. We're going to have a lot of hands-on, interactive, drill-down uh, ability to learn things, hopefully continued repetitious sort of learning over time, generation after generation, Lord willing. Now, where, um, so what part of Dallas, Texas is this museum going to be in? We're right on the sort of the central western edge, right in the middle of what they call the Metroplex there in, in Dallas, right off one of the major freeways. We've got a large acreage there. We're going to build it right contiguous to our administrative and science uh, laboratory offices. So we'll be able to continually service the museum with new information and new discoveries and so on. All of that will be there in the Dallas area, right uh, right in the center of the Metroplex. Yeah, and at, on your website, icr.org, um, you've got all the uh, drawings mm -hmm. up and everything. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it looks beautiful. And uh, how many square feet is this museum going to be? Well, it started out to about 30,000. It's going to be a little bit more than that now, including all the park area and so on. It's going to cover about five acres, so it'll be a pretty good size operation. That's great. And and uh, the vision behind this is to kind of make uh, the the truth of God's word uh, more ta something that people can touchable, kinda, yeah, seeable. more touchable, yeah. Uh, in our administration offices, we have a number of fossil plates. The kids love to touch these things. You know, they just yeah, look at it under glass; it's no fun. But if you can touch the scales on a fish or feel the bones, that's that's really cool. And we want to make it like that. Yeah, yeah. My son just this morning was like digging up. We have a big open area in our backyard. He's digging up bones, finding bones. I'm oh, like, where are you finding these bones from? That's so <laughs> fun to do that. Yeah, yeah, you bet. They want to touch everything. But uh, that's fantastic. I love that. And um, so so the vision there, you're going to carry that on, and you're going to continue to uh, promote creationism. Right. Um, do you think there's any chance that 
scientific creationism will be able to make its way into the schools of our country? or Not until the millennium. Feeling? Okay, not until Jesus returns. <laughs> okay, yeah. But we're to occupy until he comes. So yeah. We're to continue to do the testimony and the witness until the Lord returns. So you, you haven't given up hope. Oh, no. 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 Uh, no. I okay. hope he catches me when he comes right in the middle of my five-year plan. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, well, uh, I think that's fantastic. And we were talking about discipleship, the fact that, you know, the church is not doing as much as it could in that regard. We, they seem to be good about evangelism, but not as much about discipleship. We just have to be more intentional about that, would you say? Well, I think that's one of the problems about uh, kind of shifting the expectation of the Lord's return too much to the right. Mm. We're, we're, we're trying to get everybody ready to come back, but we haven't really taught them how to be a, a disciple in this world. I mean, all of the Lord's admonitions to us were to occupy, to do, to witness, to continue— and in order to be effective, you got to learn and to grow and to mature. And that was the job of the church, was to take those that the Lord would enable us to win to the kingdom, to teach them to become, well, like the Lord Jesus himself down here. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, sanctified. And um, you recently wrote a book, new book, the new book of beginnings. Mm -hmm. Now, it, this, is, this book goes along with unlocking... Right. Uh, the Mysteries Unlocking of Genesis. the Mysteries of Genesis is a, another book that Harvest House is putting out that okay. goes along with the video series that we produced a couple of years ago. Yeah. The Book of Beginnings is a, essentially was developed as a trilogy, a three-volume series. We're now compiling it into a, a carefully indexed and a real useful tool for pastors and teachers. That's great. Okay. And um, would you say that the future of creationism, when you look at it— um, do you see that the church, you know, the impact you're making in ICR, uh, obviously, I think ICR has stemmed the tide of where we would have been otherwise. In, in 1961, your father wrote um, the, the Genesis Flood. The Genesis Flood. Mm -hmm. then in, uh, but in 1962, there was a case where they actually took prayer out of schools officially, Supreme yeah. Court case. 63, they took the Bible out. And in 1968, they actually mandated, or they said, it is not constitutional to prevent evolution from being taught in the schools. Well, we don't really want to, to teach it in the secular schools. Sure. If you force a person who's an atheist to teach the Bible, it's going to teach it in a very disgusting way. Yeah. We would much rather the church do a good job of teaching this to their families so that they are able to respond and to unteach the lies and be able to encourage their children to grow in faith. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, do you feel um, that the church is receiving that well? Do you, do you Some feel are, that, yes. Yeah. But as uh, one of the pitfalls here is churches grow successfully in their evangelism efforts, sometimes they get more concerned about the brick and mortar than they do about the spiritual side of the world. And uh, the program continues to perpetuate itself. I hear what you're training. saying, yeah. Okay, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. You're on K Praise 1210 AM here in San Diego. I'm Kevin Conover. My website is educateforlife.org. If you want to get a recording of this message or many other messages I have, um, check out our website. And uh, glad you're tuning in today. We've got a couple more segments left. Stay with us. When you need tires or service, count on Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service in Oceanside for a full range of affordable options in all the brands you trust. See their great customer reviews and special offers online. Hours Tuesday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30, and Saturdays, 7.30 to 5. Call Dan and his team at 760-439-1631. Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service, 2405 Oceanside Boulevard in Oceanside, 760-439-1631. Do you have one button espresso machines in your home or business? They make delicious coffee drinks, but they're not maintenance free. Express Fix Coffee is San Diego's source for coffee and espresso machine repair, sales, and service. Call Dave Martin at Express Fix Coffee for new and used espresso machines, repairs, parts, and accessories. They'll save you time and money. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. Learn more at expressfixcoffee.com. Thanks for tuning in. You're on Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. I'm your host. 
We're also, the, our radio station is KPraise, 12, 10 a.m. here in San Diego. You can stream this show all over the world at kprz.com. And uh, my website is educateforlife.org. And uh, you can also follow us on YouTube. We've got tons of shows up there. Just recently interviewed Steve Austin, who's also a scientific creationist. He's a geologist who's traveled all over the world looking at the evidences for the truth of, of the Bible from a geological perspective. Amazing uh, information he shared with us. You can check out that show on our YouTube channel as well as uh, its podcast on iTunes. So thanks for tuning in today. My, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris the third, he is the eldest son of Henry Morris, the founder uh, of the scientific creationist movement here in America. He's also the CEO of I ICR, which is the Institute for Creation Research in Dallas, Texas. They're making a beautiful museum there meant to make the, the creation evidence and uh, the Bible more touchable, you could say. But uh, Dr. Morris, we were talking about earlier, your ministry is very heavy on the research side. You're more focused on that. And what are some of the things that right now your your ministry is investing its efforts into researching? What kind of where where one are you our, at? One of our more serious efforts is dealing with the uh, genome itself, uh, particularly with the, the differences between chimpanzee and human. You may know that that's kind of a favorite thing now. Humans are, are supposed to be our nearest ancestor. Yeah, I've heard people say things like, um, "We have." A certain amount of yeah, our usually DNA usually up in is, the high 90s is where they say we're comparative, but that's yeah. just simply not true. One of our scientists, uh, Dr. Jeff Tompkins, has been giving a lot of effort to this and has not only uncovered a lot of mistakes in what they're doing, but what they've done is really select certain portions of the genome that are similar, like looking at the way the arms are founded or the two feet or you know something that everybody has that works on land. And yeah, you're going to find a lot of similar similarities in the genome, but when you look at the overall setting and the information that makes a chimp a chimp and a person a person, the difference is enormous. And yeah. the most you can say is about 70% the same. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, and I had a, not too long ago, I had a biology uh, teacher at a public school. He emailed me and he said, hey, how do, how do you answer this homology question, mm -hmm. the fact that we, we have uh, such similar similar design to a chimpanzee, and so doesn't it make sense that we evolve from them? How well, it just makes sense that we live in the same environment. We're on land, we've got gravity, we breathe air, we eat, we drink water. I mean, all of these things are going to be similar processes. Yeah. So the information that codes our physical ability to do that will be very similar. Of course. But the difference between the 70% and the 30% that make us different is so huge in our brain power and our articulation abilities. Our chimpanzees don't compose symphonies. They don't build jets. They, yeah. <laughs> they don't build buildings. They're, they're different. Yeah. <laughs> and that difference is in the difference of the information that's in the DNA. Absolutely, yeah. I, I was talking to this guy and... Uh, basically came to the conclusion, look, uh, you know, it's pure assumption to say that we evolved from a chimpanzee. There's no scientific evidence, no evidence that's the case. Uh, and we could just as e easily say we have a common designer uh, in, in the same way, right? The, that's what the fossil record teaches. That yeah. We have a common designer. Those things that work on land function similarly, and there's going to be similar design in it. But we're very different than a fish, and very different than a clam. Yeah. And there's nothing between the clam and the fish or between the fish and the amphibian and between the amphibian and the bird. There's nothing in between. They're all designed just to fit those environments, and they appear in the fossil record just like that. Yeah, yeah. And so really all we can ultimately conclude is, hey— uh, we have a creature that was alive. It's now not alive. and Some of them are extinct. Yeah. Well, they're, we're going extinct today on a lot of animals because of the environment changes, because they're hunted for food, because mm -hmm. of a lot of things. But when we see their ancestors, they're still a clam. Yeah. They're still an amphibian. They're still a fish. They're not anything in between. Yeah, we've got some extinct ones, but when we see them in the fossil record, they're fully formed, fully articulated, fully designed, just like that with nothing transitioning before or after. Yeah, and they're even finding some fossils where uh, what they thought was extinct turns out yeah. it's still alive today, and it looks identical. Yeah, quite a bunch of them. Actually. The coelacanth is one that I coelacanth is one into. of the more famous, but yeah. 
little old cockroaches and spiders and crickets and things like that. <laughs> They're just the same in the fossil records they are here. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. And what other things are is ICR focusing on? What kind of research are they doing? Uh, you, you said genetics. Doing, doing a lot in genetics. And... Doing a lot now with the mega sequences in geology. What we're attempting to do is taking the the information that the oil companies have uncovered as they search for oil all over the world. They drill down thousands and thousands of feet and categorize the chemical makeup of the sedimentary rocks. Yeah. We've been able to plot this now pretty much worldwide, certainly over the continent of North America and South America and Africa. And we're finding the same sequence that's in the bottom of the Grand Canyon is in Africa. Same material, same place, same composition, all laid down essentially at the same time. We're building a map now of all of these what we call mega sequences, the large movements of the sedimentary deposits that are worldwide demonstrating not only the biblical message of the worldwide flood, but telling us that these things were laid down not very long ago with enormous catastrophic forces that we can't possibly duplicate. That's interesting. Now, I, I just want to get, get a bit, a little bit better information or better understanding of what you're saying. So when you say mega sequences, um, specifically the mega refers to the fact that this is found big. all over the world. Yeah, mega as big. Okay. And we find it spread out all over the world. We find it not only thick in terms of hundreds of feet, sometimes thousands of feet thick, but we find them in very specific locations. We can follow their deposit, if you will. Okay. When you see at the side of a Grand Canyon, for instance, you see those little lines, the different colors in the rocks yeah, and so on, uh -huh. those unconformities or nonconformities. Dr. Ross could do a better job of explaining this than I could. But essentially, they tell us that this material that is like pancake layers. And as you go through the pancake layers, you can follow that pancake from North America to South America to Africa, well, just all over the world. And we're mapping this now yeah. to demonstrate. And it's giving us an, a very effective way to predict where we'll find fossils, for instance. Interesting. Why we find dinosaurs in certain spots and we don't find them in other spots. Why we find certain deposits of this kind of critter in a specific place these mega sequences. Now, this is not our data. It's the oil company data. Yeah. It's data that's out there available for everybody. We've just taken the trouble to document it and to put it into the computers and build the mappings. Yeah, with it so kind of analyze can... it. Now, exactly. but, but wouldn't an evolutionist say, um, well, it's all over the world because that's evidence that all over the world this happened. Uh, ah, how do you... It happens quickly. There is no evidence for time in there. So where, where, why, how is there no evidence well, the, for time? The, the evolutionists want to talk about something happening over millions of years slowly, slowly, yeah. slowly. What we're seeing is catastrophic forces, rapid deposition, pyrocastic flows like a volcano explosion. We're seeing that kind of evidence in these deposits. Are there specific things that um, I've heard before, for example, um, somebody told me once, or I was reading an article on this, that the layers are too flat. There's no uh, millions of years of erosion between, so that there's a very sharp... Uh, many, many of them are very, sh as you say, use sharp, just like a knife edge. Yeah. Some of them have been tilted by forces like earthquakes and so on. Yeah. But many of them are, just think pancakes. The best example in North America is the Grand Canyon. Yeah. They seem just kind of flat pancakes, one on top of the other. Now, you can trace those layers. That's what we're doing now, is taking the composition of that material and finding it reproduced and mapping that out across the world. So we know from testing it in the Grand Canyon how that got laid down. Mm. We know what material is there. And when we find the same material in Africa, it's not a different deposit. It's the same deposit. Okay, so all so deposited at the huge. same time it's, by it's, one, it's one on catastrophic the planet. event. That's the point. It's a planet-wide deposit. I see what you're saying. Rather than a local deposit. That makes sense. My guest today is Dr. Henry Morris, and we're going to be right back. We have one more segment to go here. We're going to continue to talk about what ICR is doing, the research they're doing to show the evidence that the Bible, to confirm that the Bible is the truth. It is God's Word. We'll be right back. Like 
Add historic American beauty to your home today with genuine Amish furniture. It's built in the USA from solid cherry wood with a bourbon finish. Or choose alternative woods and finishes to accent your home's decor. You'll find it all at Tucker's Valley Furniture. For over 65 years, the Tucker family has served San Diego County. Still family owned. Cash and Carry and Tucker's Valley Furniture. Two stores, both right across the street at Main and Mollison in El Cajon. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teaching. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website's educateforlife.org. If you want to check out a recording of this show, pass it on to your friends. Um, I'd love you to do that. Or just give me feedback on our Facebook page or on um, Twitter, or uh, you can also listen to our podcast. That'd be fantastic. My guest today is Henry Morris, Dr. Henry Morris, and uh, he is the CEO of ICR.org, the Institute for Creation Research, started way back in the 1960s, 70s, and uh, they were started right here in San Diego, and along with Dr. Tim LaHaye. Dr. Tim LaHaye is celebrating his 90th birthday. Uh, Absolutely fantastic. And then Christian High out at, uh, at Shadow Mountain celebrating its 50th year anniversary what an incredible ministry these guys have and a heritage. Uh, Dr. Morris, when we left off, we were talking about what ICR is doing to continue to provide research uh, for for students and people all over the world who are looking for ev- I had a student just email me last week who said, uh, Mr. Conover, can you reference, can you give me any articles on the Big Bang and astronomy? I'm writing a paper for my class on the problems with the Big Bang. And here he is, you know, at a secular university uh, actually, I believe he, it's a possibly a military university, and he's here writing this paper. And if it weren't for the ministry of ICR, uh, a lot of it would be very difficult to do a lot of the, the stuff that these young people are trying to uh, write papers on and so forth. Well, that's the main reason for having this website is to archive this research that we've done over the last 45 odd years. It's searchable. It's free, um, available for anybody and everybody who wants to go in there and dig it out. We're delighted to be able to provide that resource. That's great. And um, so when we left off uh, on the last segment, we were talking about how the geological layers, you guys are actually analyzing and categorizing the data that the oil companies right. um, are are looking at. And uh, I find that very interesting. I was reading um, something recently that um, uh, Baumgartner... Mm-hmm. Uh, John Baumgartner. Yeah, John Baumgartner. He was talking about how... The layers within the strata mm-hmm. have the same amount of carbon fourteen yes, in the, the coal dif- deposits. The coal deposits, right. yeah. So is that is that? Well, that's kind of cool. Carbon fourteen. Everybody kind of knows about it, but don't really understand. That it's a very short half life, about fifty seven hundred years, and half of it gets dissipated. Mm-hmm. And if there's any left that you can measure, it's really pretty young. Now, coal is supposed to be millions of years old. But you can't measure much past fifty or sixty thousand years of carbon fourteen. So if you've got anything left in the in the coal deposit, it's got to be either contaminated, yeah, as they usually suggest, or it's got to be uh, pretty young. So we did a lot of research on this back uh, back in the early part of two thousand, where we took some coal samples from several layers from three different deposits, one way down at the bottom, about 300 million years old, all the way up near the top, about 50 million years old. And lo and behold, they measured essentially the same amount of carbon-14 in all of the deposits. Well, that simply says that they all laid down at pretty much the same time and not very long ago. So the only way to answer that is the biblical flood, really, because this deposits, these things, they're enormous. They cover... Pennsylvania and New York and, I mean, states, hundreds of square miles. And in this is the same amount of carbon-14, whether it's near the top or near the bottom, 
So it indicates it's all laid down with a very short period of time, yeah. not so very long ago. And if the evolutionary hypothesis were correct, that each of these layers was, was laid down millions of years ago, then what we would expect is that the farther you go down in the layer... You shouldn't be able to find any carbon-14 at all. That's it right. It ought to be gone completely after 100,000 years. You shouldn't be able to find a trace amount. And yet it's still being found in the very yes. bottom layers. Yes. Which indicates that all the layers were put down at the same time. Essentially at the same time. Yeah. And all over the world, as a matter of fact, one of the largest coal deposits in the world world is in antarctica wow now we don't have any fossil ferns growing down there now yeah. so something was really really different in the past yeah that's a coal bed made out of ferns and palm trees and coconuts yeah so something something, something weird is going on really there. was different so then. so would you say from a biblical hypothesis what we're saying is is that at that point in time there was forests up there in antarctica well the bible seems to indicate that the world was pretty much of a well a tropical climate let's mm -hmm, call it that mm -hmm. Uh, pretty much one landmass. That's one of Dr. Bumgardner's uh, hypotheses. It's pretty consistent, I think, that yeah. at the time of the flood, these fountains of the deep broke open and kind of sucked down the continental material and mixed it up like a blender, basically. Yeah, yeah. And we've got some pretty interesting stuff all over the world of these water-deposited rock. That's laid down by water, essentially, all over the world. That's where the fossils are. yeah. So it says flood to me. It's, a, it's kind of hard to get around it. Yeah. Now, what what have you have you ever heard uh, the response? Because I'm curious of somebody who's on the other side who who believes in long ages. How they respond to this idea that the coal or the fact that the coal has equal amounts of C14. Well, they in usually it. answer by saying it's contaminated somehow or other. It leaked down in water and leaked down in there and took some carbon with it. And that's called a rescuing device. Uh, well, it just doesn't make good science yeah yeah <laughs> it's trying to make your the evidence fit your theory rather than your theory fit your evidence exactly. right yeah so um what else is icr doing currently what kind of research are you doing doing, um, doing a lot of work on astronomy trying to deal with the shape of the universe the this not only the shape and size but we're trying to grapple with the theory of relativity and the expansion of the heavens and some of those real naughty problems like how you get starlight down here. During, yeah, really. yeah. That's we're, always been a really interesting one to me. It's a hard one to deal with because yeah. we're talking about some pretty sophisticated math. It's hard for most of us to understand. Dr. Yeah. <laughs> Lyle is working on this as well as working on the backs of Dr. Russell Humphreys, who's done a lot of work on this in the past. Okay. Now, was is Dr. Humphreys a part of your... Uh, no, Dr. Humphreys retired now. Oh, okay. He's uh, well up in years, but uh, Dr. Lyle and Dr. Hebert are taking some of his work and trying to expand it and go a little deeper. That's so exciting. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, I can't recommend uh, highly enough. If you are doing research, if you're a student, if you're teaching a Sunday school class at your church, if you're wanting to, you know, do a home fellowship on creation science, they have overwhelming amounts of information there. I mean, just endless amounts of information that you can share with people. And I know for me personally, when I was younger and I first was introduced to this kind of information, it just made my trust in the Word of God and my faith in the truth of the Bible just shot up, uh, you know, exponentially as I began to see, wow, the God of the Bible is the God of science. And so uh, huge, huge blessing. And if you're in the Dallas, Texas area, they're opening up a, a museum up there. If you want to support that, if you want to support what they're doing, uh, I, I again, please do so. You can go to their website, icr.org, and you can uh, provide uh, help support them with funds. Uh, and contributions. And we're almost out of time here, uh, Dr. Morris. Um, any uh, last encouraging words you want to give to our listeners as far as how they treat the Bible? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Yeah. And he was the one who loved us enough to die for us, Yeah, give and, himself for us. Yeah. He is our Creator and our Redeemer. We can trust Him completely. Amen. That's a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for being on the show today. Welcome. And uh Next week, we'll be back on Saturday, 2 to 3, 12, 10 a.m. here in San Diego, kprz.com, all over the world. My website is educateforlife.org. Have a fantastic Saturday. God bless you. Ooh.